Greetings. Merry Christmas. Back on the second Sunday of Advent, you may remember that we spent that Sunday looking at the message that came from the angel uh, to the shepherds. Dr. Luke records in his gospel record that the shepherds were just absolutely terrified at this sudden appearance of this majestic, glorious, angelic being and the glory of the Lord that was uh, accompanying and present with the angel. He also records that uh, those famous words uh, that the angel spoke to the shepherds, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. <clears throat> he is Christ the Lord. And what we focused on that Sunday was the titles that the angel had ascribed to Jesus as uh, that message was delivered. That he would be the Savior, the Christ, and the Lord. Now, those titles not only describe who Jesus is, but what he would do. Now, it is said that there are over 200 names and titles for Jesus in the whole of scriptures. <laughs> I haven't counted, uh, but I'll take their word for it. But I am aware that there are many of those names and titles that require some background uh, explanation in order for us to understand the meaning and the application to us in the 21st century. And so it is with the names of Jesus that we look at today from our text in Isaiah's prophecy, chapter 9, verse 6. I hope you've read, actually, the passages that I lift uh, in, in the description for this video. Now, that verse, 9, 6, uh, has been what we call our um, memory verse in live worship each Sunday. That is, the congregation... Uh, recites it uh, in unison um, out loud so that we uh, memorize that verse. And the reason I did that intentionally was because the names that Isaiah uses for Jesus in that verse had a very specific uh, application to uh, the people to whom Isaiah was prophesying, the, the Ju uh, Judeans. And, and those names that he used for Jesus have the very same significance to us today in the 21st century. Well, the circumstances in Judah back in the ancient world uh, are not much different from our circumstances today. They were led by King Ahaz. And as a nation, they had failed miserably in their role as God's chosen people. God was not defeated, however. He had a plan to bring salvation and redemption to all who would receive him. Well, the background, and I made note of this in the description, uh, for this chapter, chapter 9, is obviously chapter 8. These two chapters are uh, tied together pretty uh, significantly. And in chapter 8, Isaiah is speaking a word of warning. He describes uh, the conditions in uh, northern Israel, uh, and he describes the punishment and chastisement of the Lord that was coming because of their disobedience. In verse 15 of chapter 8, he says, Many of them will stumble, they will fall and be broken, and they will be snared and captured. But in our text, in chapter 9, Isaiah's tone changes. God gave him a message of hope for the future. And no matter how, how bad those circumstances were in uh, Judah at that time, God is sovereign. God is gracious. He had a plan to redeem and rescue his people. So I want you to listen uh, for a moment uh, to verse 1 of chapter 9. That verse begins with the word nevertheless. In other words, tying it to chapter 8 and all of the uh, disobedience, the evil, and the uh, 
chastisement that came because of it. Nevertheless, there will be, he switches to the present, I mean the future tense, there will be no more gloom for those who were, past tense, in distress. He's talking about the remnant of faithful um, in Judah. He said, in the past he, speaking of God, humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles. Now, Zebulun and Naphtali are two tribes of the 12 tribes of Israel. They lived in northern Palestine or Israel, um, which was in Jesus' day called Galilee. Right? Same territory, just different names. What I want you to notice about that one verse is that it is God that is actively dispensing chastisement because God is in control. He uses difficult circumstances to discipline his people, to bring them back to him because they have nowhere else to go for redemption and rescue. It kind of makes me wonder what God has in store for America today given our current state of chaos and immorality and uh, corruption in our national leadership and uh, uh, political scene. But what I want you to remember about this passage in Isaiah is that he is speaking of the future, but he also is speaking grammatically in the past tense. You see, God had a plan, and he gave Isaiah the, these words of, a future a rescue. And Isaiah is so sure of what God is going to do for this faithful remnant of Judah that he speaks of it as if it's already happened. He speaks of it in the past tense. Listen to verses 2 through 5. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Now, Isaiah is speaking somewhere between 750 and 800 years before these events take place, and yet he's speaking in the past tense. That's his level of confidence. For God, or for you, he says, uh, meaning God, have enlarged the nation. That's why they've seen this light, and, there, and now a light has dawned. And he goes on and he says, you have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder, victory in war. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you will remember the Old Testament story of the character Gideon, who God raised up to defend and defeat the Midianites against uh, the Jewish people. The Midianites were oppressing them severely. So he goes on and he says, you have shattered, speaking of God, the uh, yoke that burdens them, the bar that was across their shoulders, and the rod of their oppressors. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. Now, Isaiah is speaking to this remnant within Judah who had stayed faithful to God and his law. And yet he's uh, speaking in the future. And despite the failure of their leadership, King Ahaz and all of the priests, like our political and religious leaders today, their failure, uh, these people had stayed faithful. And that's who Isaiah is, trying, is speaking of here in chapter 9. In New Testament words, we would look at the Apostle John as he writes in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. He says, this is the victory that overcomes the world. The world, the, the word world in, in biblical language means the secular world, the non-spiritual uh, or non-Christian uh, world. 
This is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith in God. What Isaiah is saying is that God will be our Gideon, if you will, bringing victory over our enemies, those who oppress us today. He's speaking to the Judeans, but the application is just as equal to us. Just like Gideon defeated the Midianites, Jesus, God, will defeat the evil that we see in our land. So the message here for this morning for both the Judeans and for us is this. Maintaining a consciousness of God's sovereignty, that he is all-powerful, that he is mighty, that he is in total control. It redefines the difficult circumstances, the uncertainty uh, and fear that we feel, but he will do that because of our faith in him. So there's a parallel here between the faithful remnant of Judah, where they face disaster and chastisement from God because of the nation's disobedience, and our fear, anxiety, uncertainty, because of our culture's rejection of God. Uh, we glorify uh, disobedience of God by our, uh, or with our uh, social and immoral excesses. You know, the truth is that we will, res will uh, respond to God in his word, or how we respond to God in his word, determines how we experience him. God can be our Savior, our Lord, our King, or He can be our judge, jury, and executioner. We can experience His blessings or we can experience His wrath. It's our choice, just as it was for the people of Judah in the ancient world. There's no difference. The Bible teaches us that God is absolutely, totally, unavoidable. Oh, you can ignore him, different word, but he's not, you're not able to avoid him. Look at Matthew chapter 21. You know, in our day, some people dismiss God. They distort his word. They make it, the Bible say things it does not say, and they will stumble and fall, and they will experience God's wrath. The Bible teaches that. But grace and faith hold the remnant, those of us who stay faithful uh, to the word of God and to him, it holds us true. It holds us fast. We will experience God's blessing and his redemption. God as our liberator will not only defeat the forces of evil, he will defeat and destroy evil itself. And this is the message of hope that Isaiah has for the ancient world, the people of Judah, the remnant in Judah. This is Isaiah's message of hope to us this morning. Well, how is God going to accomplish this mighty feat? God says, I'm going to do it with a child. A child? Yeah. A child. God says, with a child. So who is this conquering hero that's going to uh, destroy and end evil and corruption and violence and immorality? The baby Jesus, born in a stable, laid in a manger, a feeding trough for farm animals. God's answer to everything and anyone who has ever terrorized his people persecuted us, said all kinds of manner of evil and destructive, demeaning things against us simply because we are Christians, is a child. The power of God is so great, so superior to all the evil and corrupt forces that we have ever seen in history. He can defeat them with a child, a child whose name is Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, 
and Prince of Peace. Who can stand against the one whose kingdom will never end? It is eternal and will sit on the throne of David as God promised David in the ancient world. He will sit on the throne of David forever. Who can stand against this child who is actually the Messiah of God, the Lord of life, the King of Kings, our Savior? And Isaiah ends that passage with the words, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. This is the king whose kingdom I want to serve in. How about you? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for these words of hope from Isaiah that gives us peace and security in the midst of chaos and destructiveness and evil, because we know that you are sovereign, that you have a plan, and our faith in you overcomes these circumstances. So as we celebrate the birth of this baby Jesus, we recognize that he was, in fact, God in human form, coming to pay the consequences for our sin and being, or coming again as being uh, the Lord of life, the King of kings, and judge over all. Thank you for these truths, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. I trust you've had a great Christmas.